Okay, sorry about that. In the portion of Mahaloitzcha towards the end, we get to some difficult times for the Jewish people. They're complaining a lot. They're going through some restlessness. And then we get towards chapter 11. And in chapter 11, the complaint is on the manna from heaven. They're not happy with the food. They're upset with the manna from heaven. I'll read to you from the verses. But the multitude among them began to have strong cravings. And then even the children of Israel once again began to cry. And they said, who will feed us meat? We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt free of charge. We remember the cucumbers, the watermelons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. I kid you not, that's text of the Bible. That's what our grandparents were complaining about. They were complaining about pickles, watermelon, onion, and garlic. I continue from the text. But now our bodies are dried out, for there is nothing at all. We have nothing but manna to look at. Now the manna was like coriander seed, and its appearance was like the appearance of crystal. The people walked about and gathered it, then they ground it into a mill or crushed it in a mortar, cooked it in a pot, and made it into cakes. It had a taste like the taste of oil cake. When the dew descended on the camp at night, the manna would descend upon it. So the Torah is saying it was so good, it was so miraculous, and it tasted so fine, and yet they mocked it, they knocked it, like, well, this is what we have to live on all this time. Listen to verse number 10. Listen to the power of this verse. Moses heard the people weeping with their families, each one at the entrance of their tent. The Lord became very angry. God was very, very upset. And Moses considered it ra. We got real problems. He considered it evil. The complaints begin to spread, tent to tent. God lets his feeling be known. And Moses sees that it's very bad. So unlike where there is a revolt of a group that's huddled in the middle of the camp, this one was different. This one was a nation starting to look at their sad state of being. And they're crying inside their tents. Each one's crying inside their tents. Was stuck here in this wilderness. Even though, by the way, at this point, they were on their way to Israel. This is before the decree about waiting for 40 years. What does it mean when it says a Moshe saw that it was bad? He takes it personally. Moshe feels that he failed. If after more than a year of his leadership, if after a year of Sinai instructions, if after the building of the Mishkan of the Tabernacle, the building of the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, if after miracle after miracle, there's still a complaining people, and they're complaining over what, over pickles and garlic and herring, then I failed miserably at my leadership. He saw it was bad. He's looking at himself and he says, I must have messed up. He's blaming himself. In the past, we have God getting angry and Moses remains the calm defender. Remember his opening words after the golden calf is, why are you getting so angry, God? Don't you think the golden calf is worse than this one? And yet here, Moshe has lost it. Why is it different? Over here, he takes it as a no-confidence vote himself. By the golden calf, he wasn't there. He was up with God in heaven getting the, the Torah. But now he was here. He's been leading them. And they're still complaining like this. And they're supposed to be onwards to the promised land. And instead, you're going to complain about cucumbers and leeks? I want to read you the next few verses because just hearing the words of Moses... I want you to feel, feel what he's feeling for a moment. Put yourself now in Moses' shoes. Moses says to the Lord, so he's talking to God. This is his response. Why have you treated your servant so badly? Why have I not found favor in your eyes that you place the burden of this entire people upon me? Did I conceive this entire people? that I give birth to them, that you say to me, carry them in your bosom as the nurse carries the suckling to the land you promised their forefathers? Did I give birth to them? Where can I get meat to give all these people? They're crying to me saying, give us meat to eat. 
Alone, I cannot carry this entire people. It's too hard for me. If this is the way you treat me, please, I beg you, kill me if I have found favor in your eyes so that I not see my misfortune. You hear those words from Moses? That's how bad, that's how much this Trump troubled him. This is no longer about them. This is about him. We've rarely seen this side of him. You know, we saw him angry at God when he came to Egypt the first time and the taskmasters were still beating upon the Jews and he said to God, why are you dealing so evil with these people? They didn't do anything wrong and it was Pharaoh beating upon them. So Moshe there too wanted to quit. He didn't want to continue with the job. But here he's frustrated with the Jewish people and he's upset that God put him in this leadership position. What Moses is saying is that from day one, I did not want this job. From day one, I told you I wasn't qualified. My lack of leadership skills must be what is leading to all these complaints and this dissatisfaction. And the very fact that I felt this way and I still feel this way wasn't reason enough for you to listen to my request. I begged you not to give me this job and you forced me into this job. Isn't confidence an important part of leadership skills? Is not the fact that I don't trust myself in this position reason enough not to have appointed me? Why did you insist that I take the job? Not only did you make me take the job, but you put the whole burden on me. It's all on my head. I should feed them. Who am I? One man. And not just to take them out of Egypt, which was the original deal, and not just to deal with Pharaoh, but now it's become a permanent position. Now it's a full-time job, not just a one-mission job. Take them full through the wilderness. Oh, feed them. Be their mother. Be their father. Be their rabbi. Be their therapist. Be their leader. Be their coach. When did I sign up for this? You know, when a parent is frustrated with the job of parenting, we can say, hey, you made the choice. You decided to be a parent. And there is a, also a natural respect that a child has for a parent, that a teacher has when a teacher complains about a tough class, you say, you signed up for this. But here, here, I didn't choose to be their parent. I didn't choose to be their teacher. This was thrust on me. And not only that, they never chose me either. I was thrust on them. I told you then I don't have the eloquence of speech to inspire. They make demands of me that is impossible. I obviously don't have the influence over them to convince them that these complaints for their garlic and for their onions and their cucumbers are baseless. Moshe accepts his intellectual gifts. He knows that. Yes, I may be the right man to receive the Torah, to teach the Torah. I can give a shir. I can give a discourse. I can, I can lead a, a discussion on Torah thought. That I know I can do. But I don't see myself with the skill to make these people a nation that's fit for the Torah, a nation that matches the nation that the Torah envisions. Maybe Moshe thought that as the job went on, he would be equipped with new skills. Maybe he thought he would acquire new strengths. Maybe he thought he would have the ability to speak with eloquence. And he keeps seeing these weaknesses that he has lead to troubles. To the point, as I say in the verse that I just read, he basically prefers death over the continuation of this job description. He can't do it anymore. What Moshe doesn't realize is that it is this humility that he has that makes him so uniquely qualified to lead the Jewish nation. Because you combine this intellectual prowess that he had together with this humility that he has, with the spiritual strength that he has, and with the love of the people that he has, and you have indeed a perfectly qualified man. He knows, he knows that God is angry and he prefers, he prefers death than to have to watch God show his anger at the Jewish people. He has an example of a father and son both condemned to death by the court and the father asks the judge to do me a favor, execute me first so I don't have to watch my child killed. That's in a way what Moses is saying. You know, God, take me first. 
I don't want to see how you're angry, what you're going to do, and how many people will die. I'm not interested in this. So the question that I have today is, do leaders need to want to lead? Should leaders want to be leaders? See, the Israelites are complaining about their food. The rabble among them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing. And they said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt at no cost and the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks. But now we've lost our appetite because all we see all day is the manna. It's not a new story. We've heard this before. Yet on this occasion, Moses experiences, experiences this, this breakdown. Moses prays for death. You know, if we do a search throughout Tanakh, throughout the books of the Torah, we find that he's not the only man that prayed for death. There are at least three other occasions. There is Elijah, when after his successful confrontation with the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel, Queen Jezebel issues a warrant that he be killed. And I quote to you, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. Powerful. Then we have the story of Jonah. After God had forgiven the inhabitants of Nineveh, Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, this is not what I said when I was still at home. That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah, too, is asking God, take my life. And then there is there's Jeremiah. After the people fail to heed his message and they publicly humiliate him, we find Jeremiah Yermio saying, Oh Lord, you enticed me and I was enticed. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. The word of the Lord has brought me insults and reproach all day long. Caused, cursed be the day I was born. May the day my, my mother bore me not, not, may the day, excuse me, May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought my father the news, made him very glad, saying, A child is born to you, a son. Why did I ever come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow and to end my day in shame? Moshe, Jeremiah, Elijah, Yonah, begging God to take their life. Why are the greatest so often haunted by this sense of failure? The very sense of responsibility that leads a prophet to heed the call of God can also lead him to blame himself when the people around him don't heed the call. They take it personally. They take the responsibility personally. They carry it on their shoulders. And if it's not working, they take the blame. They carry the blame. But yet it is that same inner voice that ultimately holds the cure. Because the prophet doesn't believe in himself, but he does believe in God. He he does not undertake to lead because he sees himself as a leader, but because he sees a task that needs to be done and no one else is willing to do it. And his greatness lies not within himself, but beyond himself, in his sense of being summoned to a task that must be done, however inadequate he knows himself to be. You see, the spirit can be part of leadership itself. For when the prophet sees himself reveled and rebuked and criticized, when his words fall on stony grounds, when he sees people listening to what they want to hear, not what they need to hear, That is when the last layers of self are burned away, leaving only the task, the mission, the call. And when that happens, a new greatness is born. It now no longer matters that the prophet is unpopular and unheeded. All that matters is the work and the one who summoned him to it. And that is when the prophet arrives at the truth that Rabbi Tarifon taught us, it is not for you to complete the task, but neither are you free to stand aside from it.
Moses, the success in the mission is not up to you. The effort in the mission is all I ask. Do what I ask. Lead. You may have some rough days. This is one of them. But lead, because you are the perfect leader. You know why? Because you don't want the leadership. You know, we say an expression, lahavdil elef avdalo, so which means sometimes we use a parable, an example, but we want to make sure that the audience doesn't equate the two. So I'm not going to try to equate Theodore Roosevelt with Moses and with Jeremiah and with Elijah and with Jonah. But in the speech that Theodore Roosevelt gave, he gave the speech to students at the Sorbonne in April of 1910. And this is what he said. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could actually have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcomings, but it does actually strive to do the deed. Who knows great enthusiasm, great devotion, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails, while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. It's easy to stay on the sidelines. It's easy to knock those who are trying. It's easy to put them down. The leader stands up and leads not because he wants leadership, not because he has an ego, not because he feels he is the greatest, but because he's summoned, he's put on a mission by God. Leadership in a noble cause can bring despair. We see that in Moses, but it also can bring the cure. And we see that in Moses too. Thank God that God did not listen to Moses and that Moses was able to be convinced to stay the course and to lead and to lead the Jewish people through the difficult 40 years in the wilderness. But in those 40 years in the wilderness, yes, even with all of the revolting and even with all the complaining, our ancestors were molded into becoming an Am Kadosh, into becoming a holy people a chosen people, committed to a mission that was given to them at Sinai. And Moses brought them right up to that last inch to have Joshua then take over and bring them into the land of Israel. Everyone have a wonderful, wonderful Shabbat. Our shul, as you may have heard, our shul is open. We are open for services tonight at 7 o'clock. We're open for services tomorrow at 10 o'clock. We do keep social distancing. The chairs are separated by six feet unless you're within the same family, then you can sit together. If you do want to come for services tomorrow, please drop me a text at 818-516-0444 or an email at rabbi at chabadkeneo.com so that we can go ahead and make sure to reserve a seat for you. Shabbat Shalom to all. Our uh, summer semester is now on jewishacademy.com. You can go there and see everything we're offering for our summer semester. Shabbat Shalom to all.